Good morning, Life Church. Good morning. As we come to the end of October, I love October. Like my favorite. And this has been an exceptional, exceptionally beautiful fall, it seems like. And uh, the wind comes today, and that's all over. <laughs> we are glad to see you this morning, and um, I want to. We're going to just talk this morning just because it's a subject of necessity. We're going to talk about hope. This is for Dodger fans <laughs> as, well, as well as everyone else. I grew up a Dodger fan back in the old days. and I was still playing in the Coliseum when guys like Wally Moon and Duke, yeah, Duke Snyder. Don Drysdale, those guys were playing. That, how many of you actually remember baseball? That was baseball. Yeah, it was good. So we're glad you're here, and uh, we just want to talk because it's just this is one of those things that, as pastors, as everyone, as, as believers, we run into hopeless people all the time, and people who live with hope tend to be really refreshing people. In this day and age, how many of you know they're easy, easy to spot? Because there's so many people that seem turning all the time. Another connection, another person, another promise. Always looking for something that's going to make me feel like I can get through my life another day. And we as believers, we have, we have the most secure and permanent reason to hope of anybody on the face of this earth, yet we too are susceptible. We are glad you have, we have a lot of men up the, the hill today. Pastor Dave is down in Midtown, making sure we keep that connection alive, that wonderful congregation growing down there. We're glad you're here, uh, though, with me. Uh, it gives me someone to talk to. There's a, there's a story that's become really famous in, in uh, Christian history, a, a day, really, that was written down in, uh, in John Wesley's journal. The date was January 25th, 1736. He was on his way to America. He and his brother Charles, as well as some others that had come to help them, they were being sent by the Anglican Church, by the Church of England, to become missionaries in, in the colony, in what was what was America, to strengthen the church, to reach in. They were, they were reaching towards, his brother Charles had interests in the Native Americans, and they were reaching and, and were as well equipped, I suppose, as you could be. About midway in the Atlantic, they hit a storm that was one of those storms. It, it broke the mast off, off the boat, it, the, the mainsail. It pulled the seams apart, water was leaking, and it looked like there was no hope. Night looked like day, and day looked like night. It was terrible. And uh, on that particular day, it was a Sunday. It's a reason it was significant. There was also a gr another group of people on this boat. They called Moravians. They were, from, they were from Germany, and they were some of the earliest Protestant groups. They were very humble, very servant-oriented, and they had already been helping people during this entire, this entire journey. As Floyd had been helping people and doing things for people that were sometimes too sick to do anything, they, they just did it. And in the midst of this storm, they met and had church. And as he listened to them, as John Wesley listened to them singing hymns in the midst of this tossing and realized these people are not disturbed like me. I am afraid. I'm going to die. And yet they seem to have a hope. They seem to have something in them that he understood at that moment he did not possess. The others that come, came with him, the ones he refers to as the English, the English, and he referred to them as the Germans. He said they, they had this perfect peace in the midst of the storm, and the, and the English were crying out for mercy and screaming in the, in the hull of the ship. And when the, the Moravians finished their service, John Wesley went to see them. As it turned out, he became more disturbed by their peace than he was by the storm. 
And he said, what is it? How, how are you this way in the midst of, of this danger? And they just talked about how their hope, their lives were rooted in something different than the elements, something different than the circumstances, something different than the threat. They looked beyond that and they saw one and they basically were like the three, three Hebrew children, you know, the three men. They said, you know what? We know God can deliver us. We think he's going to, but if he doesn't, we're still his. And they were just that solid, and it so shook him, he put it in his journal, and it started his own personal journey of trying to figure out what they've got that I do not have. And out of that came the Methodist movement. He went back, ended up going back to England and, and began to preach a different kind of a faith. He had a personal connection or relationship with Jesus that began. And he ended up preaching in the streets in the Methodist church, not only became a powerhouse in, in Great Britain, but became a powerhouse in America. If you read the history, the religious history of America, they play an enormous role in the development of this country. One day... One storm brought help and hope to a whole lot of people. Hope is a difficult thing to define. In the, in the culture of the moment, maybe a culture always, it, uh, hope is this foggy, wishful thinking that places trust in the alignment of all the right circumstances. As I'm just you know, kind of grunting, hoping that everything works out right. I, I want the right timing, the right people. If I could just meet the right people or the right people would step in, maybe with a little push for me so I could, I, I, I become the, the, the puppet, puppeteer behind the scenes that, that makes the things begin to happen. Something good just might happen. Something might change. Something might be different. Maybe I have enough experience in my past to say that this is possible or other people have told me their lucky stories and I'm thinking of them and, and I, there are all these ways. My own imagination, you don't have to put your hands up, but, but how many of you start to imagine an outcome that if you got right down to it, it's so magical in the way, it's, it's like all the stars are going to have to align, you know. But in my mind, and, and it's funny because in those stories, in those personal sitcoms that we develop for ourselves, where we're the main character, we always win. <laughs> Just like real life. Right? See, th there's something in us. God has put something in us to hope. Because hope begins to point us in the direction we need to go. But the hope was meant to point us towards him. As Jesus followers, biblically and practically, our hope is very much attached to the character of God. You hear me? Not just the word of God, but the one who spoke the words. The words are true and trustworthy because his character is true and trustworthy. And if he said it, he meant it. So we have this different place that we hook, and that we hook our, our, our lives to, like the Moravians. Our hope is in this unseen one who's seen in a million ways in our lives. See, the good news is about him is he, does, he doesn't change. Micah, the, the prophet Micah, or, or excuse me, the, the prophet Malachi wrote one time, said, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. <laughs> he said, you're lucky I don't change. <laughs> because right now I'm not happy with you. you know? So you're lucky I love you. You're lucky I don't change. So how do we get there? How do we shift our allegiances? Because we put our hope in so many places. Among them, God. Among them, Jesus, but there's so many others. How do we shift our allegiance so that he is first? And things can change because we are hooked to something permanent. First of all, God is the God of hope. Turn with me to Romans 15, 13. I always get there, and so do you. It's just so I'm glad. I'm going to read it in the NIV because it feels like it has a little more punch than uh, the SV on this particular one. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. There's a thought. Filled with joy and peace as you trust 
in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a decent verse. I like that verse. It says a whole lot of things about the way he works in my life when I turn towards him. May the God of hope fill me with joy and peace. There's, there's two results of, of letting my allegiance shift to him and away from the other things that I think are going to bring me relief and bring me answers. Joy and peace. But then he says I can overflow. How many have you ever let your children pour their own milk? How many of you found it to be a waste? Because it just keeps coming, and somehow whatever's between here and there, it's still coming out, and they're going, oh, my goodness, look at that. <laughs> and it takes a while for them to pull that thing back. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I have this thing I'm working on. See, that's what he's saying, overflowing. I, I just keep pouring and I keep pouring, overflowing. It's a great word. But what am I overflowing with? Hope. Why? Because we of all the people on the earth have a reason that we do not have to manufacture ourselves. I will be the solid source of all that you are and all that you become. See, the Bible says that, that God is the author of the beginning and the end, the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Revelations 1.8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That also being that, it makes him the, the author of everything in between the beginning and the end. He says, I am the God I, of who is for right now, but I'm also the God of what was. The God who is, the God who was. What, you see, the, this is part of the challenge that, that you and I have. We have memories. <laughs> we remember past, we remember times when, when maybe we did hope in the wrong person, the wrong thing. Someone let me down, somebody damaged me, where I wasn't the one who sinned, I, I was the one who was sinned against. And then we remember those things when I was the one who sinned. It was my fault. And that memory clings to us. And we go back over our shoulder to try to, to draw some sort of a picture. And it begins to leak into our souls this toxic chemical that we start to, we start to think that it's, it's, it's always going to be like that. Does everyone understand he is the God of your past, the God who was able to walk back into those moments and begin to change those memories, not that it didn't happen, but that he begins to change the meaning and the impact of that because now he begins to settle it in him. And he's the God who is. He's the God who's right now. Whatever I'm in, whatever I'm facing, I don't have to call him away from whatever he's doing to come and pay attention now. But he's also the God of to come. What's out there, to, what's to come tomorrow? It's not just when he comes back and whips us all and whatever that's going to look like when we finally all agree on theology. It's not that moment. It's, it's tomorrow. How many of you think you might need him tomorrow? I am the Lord your God. I change not. He says, I, I was the God for you even when you didn't know it behind you, I was the God of today, I am the God of tomorrow, and you can count on that. See, there's just something about hope. Hope looks forward, doesn't it? By definition, hope looks forward. The Greek word for hope is a word that means to look forward, um, uh, to, look forward to with pleasurable confidence and expectation. There's something in it, in us. It, it turns me in another direction. And another thing about hope is it has a direction. It has a destination. When there's hope in him, it is taking me somewhere. See, hope for us, for the believer, is rooted in his promises. His promises are rooted in his character. We said this in the beginning, but probably can't emphasize it enough. Why can't I trust the word of God? 
Because I can trust the God of the word. He said it and he meant it. It wasn't wishful thinking on his part. It wasn't him casting around trying to make me feel good about myself and then just hoping like everything that it was all going to come out all right. This is the God who knew. This is the God who imagined you at the beginning of time and fit you into the world that you're living in and then wanted to become the center of that so he could change the whole meaning of who you are and why you are here from the thing that you've started to believe about yourself. He has a better thought about you. He has a better end for you. And it's in him that I hope. See, how many of you know that trustworthy people are a treasure? You got somebody in your life that I mean you trust. It's nice that I can say about some people in my life, maybe my wife most particularly, but to say no matter what, I would trust them with anything. I would, how many of you know that there are some people you would not trust to make the decision whether to pull the plug on you or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you too, huh? Yeah. There are some I will not assign that duty to. But there are some that I trust enough to offer them anything that I have and that I am because I know they will keep their promises. They will be, they'll do their best anyway to be. Even they have got their failures, they've got their moments, and we know how that is, that in humanity there's just this flaw. But to have that person who's going to do their best to try to make it so, what a treasure. God wants to be that in your life because he doesn't have the flaw that even the most trustworthy individual has. He is that one. You know, I think it's gotten hard for mankind to really believe and see how big our God really is because he's not, he's not the, the world's not seeing him reflected in our lives very well. We are as fearful and as distrusting as anybody else in the world. And yet here we are with the deepest source no matter what happens to me, like the Moravians, no matter what happens, I know he can, I think he will. If he doesn't, I'm still his. And that attitude of being able to see, whole people, there's something about hope when it's in him that helps make us whole. It fixes what's broken in us. And, and when I'm fixed, how many of you know that whole people really stand out in this world? You know a few? Whole people, people who are well in their souls, those people stand out. Not only that, usually people want to know how you got to be that way. How are you that person? So, may God fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the power of the Holy Spirit... Um, does everyone understand that is an unending source? God, in fact, living where? If I'm a follower of Jesus, he's living here. And he would be accessed for hope. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows me better than anyone else. He knows my father perfectly. I can trust who he is in my life. Also, hope, we tend to misunderstand, misdirect, and misplace our hope. Proverbs eleven seven: 7, hope placed in mortals die with them. All the promise of their powers come to nothing. Ah, that was an encouraging verse. But he's seen something. He knows something about the way this thing works. He knows there's a link between hopelessness and misplaced trust. That we have a God who is able to fill us with hope. He's the author of hope. And that, and that hope works like a weather vane. The weather vane, when the wind blows, it, it's built to turn, to swivel into the wind and point into the direction that the wind is coming from. So wherever your hope is, that's where your weather vane goes. If your hope is in God and in the Father and in his goodness and his character, then when the winds begin to blow, you're, you won't be able to help it. 
Your go-to will be to, right towards him. But if I'm trusting in all the other things that come and make an offer to me, I can trust in family, I can trust in government, I can trust in education, I can trust in social system. In America, we trust in celebrities. We, we love nothing more than to have a celebrity tell us what to think. Two hit movies and they're, you know, experts. Celebrities. <laughs> Uh, we trust in science. We, we trust in believing the right economic policy. All of these things that are, are, you know, the wind is blowing and we swivel and we think, yeah, the answers are coming from there. You know what? Some answers will come from these places. But let me tell you something. They will never give you the eternal and solid foundation that you need, that hope in the one who loved me and died for me will give you. There is, there is a permanence in that. I'm sure we all watched with fascination in this as waiting to see who won the $1.5 billion mega millions this last week. You don't have to raise your hand. Anybody here have a ticket? <laughs> Worthless, wasn't it? Somebody got really rich and everybody else got a little bit poorer. Didn't they? I, you know, I could hope in that. There are people who try to look for those big things, the big score. For most people, that, I'm sure that was just a lark. You know, let's get in on something that's kind of fun and do it. But there are people who live that way. Their hope is it's, it's so far out there that they no longer are able to know what happens in the moment. Sometimes we get so invested in the world that we've imagined and called hope that we fail to act in the moment where things actually can be changed. Are you with me? See, here's, here's another truth about hope. It's meant to be an anchor as well, as well as the thing that points me forward. It's an anchor. They, we, there are some that just imagine this world and, and so they, they never deal with today. Everything is down the road for them and it makes living today an impossible Task. I read a, read a story, tried to verify it, but you're just going to have to rely on my memory. This guy was writing about a, a, a dinner guest he had. Someone had invited people to dinner, and they brought this guy with him. And, and this is some years ago. But um, it, the guy had grown up going to see family in a place called Flagstaff, Maine. The town no longer exists. And he would go and, and spend his summers there, Beautiful little town, a lake or a river running through there. But it came one year, and the town was falling into disrepair. Nobody had mowed their lawns. Nobody had watered their plants. The, the paint was pe starting to peel. There were broken windows that weren't fixed. You know, and it, it had taken this, this brand new uh, bedraggled, seedy appearance. Well, when he got there, he found out that, that they were building a dam uh, down river and and in about six months this whole thing was going to be underwater and, and now it's Flagstaff Lake in Maine but everybody everybody was still living there nobody had left yet but the town had began to just show this woe-begone appearance and then he said this the punchline I remember where there is no faith in the future there is no power in the present this being able, God gave us hope because he knew that, that while we are waiting for the thing we hope for, that we can begin to deteriorate if we also aren't anchored to something permanent. Sometimes waiting means acting. It means making sure I'm turning my life in that direction, doing the things I can do, repairing what can be repaired, caring for relationships, doing things that I know how to do where there's no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. And discouragement kills us. It's meant to be an anchor. It says this in Hebrews 6, 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. You need to go read this on your own. It's a great passage of Scripture. We, we hang on to this because God cannot lie to us, and, the, and I, the hope is real. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope 
that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Inner curtain is, is just code for. It's, it's code for the things that we can't see, but they are more certain than the things I can. Hope for the future. Howard Hed Hendricks wrote, uh, he said, discouragement is the anesthetic the devil uses as a person, on a person before he reaches in and carves out his heart. Discouragement, when we move and shift our eyes away that, from the things that could be if God is in the center. I wrote a little list here of the things that, that keep us from hoping, where we misplace, misdirect, mis misbelieve. In the thing we hope, we, we mistake what hope is supposed to be. What are you believing about yourself right now that keeps you from hope? What lie is there? What, what memories discourage you from believing that things can ever be better? What unfinished business keeps you from seeing a better and a more complete outcome? What memories do you hang on to and you think they're, they're real, they define who you are, and when in fact Jesus has set you free? Do you self-produce apocalyptic outcomes for your, for your predicaments, making the desired solution impossible? Do you go immediately to its cancer and know it's a mosquito bite? Do you know those people? Well, I mean, if cancer, then there's no, you know, it's like you go there first, everything you back up from that, it's like, it's got to be better. No. <laughs> Apocalyptic outcomes. What idea are you so committed to that it's taken on a life its own, of its own and separated you from true hope? What thing have you so gripped onto? What possible rescue scenario have you projected so far out in the future that you are no longer, you no longer have a stake in today? Is that all possible? Those are things I've viewed in my life and in other people's lives. Where, and, they, and they end up in a hopeless situation because they forget. They, they keep looking in the, the, over their shoulder. And hope points you forward. The kingdom is always out there. It's always forward. Jesus, Jesus is leading me that way. Finally, hope in God is, it gives me strength. Psalm 62, 5 and 6. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. It's, it's from him. It's not something I, I conjure up. It comes from him. Truly, he's my rock and my salvation. He's my fortress. I will not be shaken. Um, hope points, points us when it's in the right direction when it's attached to the permanence of God's character. When it's really attached in who he is. Even more than what he said to me about he's the one who said it. It gives me strength when I turn my hope in that direction. But hope, as I said earlier, gives me the strength to wait. Oftentimes, that's what it's, that's what it's doing. It prepares and anticipates, prepares me and anticipates God's provision and answers. It also gives me an idea of how I can act to move things along. There's something about waiting on God. I, I did a study one time, I never preached it, but I, I took a couple months off of sabbatical, and, and one of the things was I did a study on waiting in the Bible. Everything where, where waiting was suggested, you know, long-suffering, patience, thing, words of that nature that kind of suggest. And what I, what I learned was waiting is not just sitting there like a lump, but rather there's something that I am engaging in that moment in my own soul as well as in God that is turning me. It's part of how the weather vane begins to turn. And as I wait, as I wait, I, I learn to hear. I learn to listen. And as I listen, I learn God's voice. And as I learn God's voice, I learn to do his will. And as I learned to do his will, I learned to wait. It's just one of those wonderful, wonderful circular uh, moments. God brings me back around. Hope. Hope is the thing that points me. It gives me strength. Um, in, in him, and therefore in what's coming. But it starts with us. We are ground zero. Our heart is ground zero. 
when I discover that hope in, God, in Christ's promises and his love really leads me somewhere, really changes me, really anchors me, I begin to realize that hope in dark moments is not simply positive thinking. It is rock-solid connection to the eternal. It is trusting in the unchangeable character of God. What are the habits? What's going on in your life? What are you exercising? If you're one of those persons that struggles with hope, let's just, let's just talk. You don't have to tell me. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe you do. <laughs> what are, there are things you can do that are going to make this easier for you. And they're really simple. You already know about them. Are you reading your Bible? Are you in your Bible? Because it's full of all kinds of thoughts God's already thought about you. It's full of all kinds of information and promises and direction. There's so much in there. I, I kept a little record just for today of things I read in my Bible reading over the last week. Just things that popped out at me and encouraged me or spoke to me in some very specific moment or thing in my life. Deuteronomy. I mean, who gets blessed in Deuteronomy? <laughs> Deuteronomy 32. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. You thought you knew who the rock was? <laughs> He's nothing compared to this one. The rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Here's another one. I just discovered this little nugget in Psalm 36 for about the 400th time. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man, man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. This one, I've been reading Psalms 103 for whatever reason every day now for about two weeks. I love this psalm. So I've, I've got, you're going to get a little part of it here. Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and everything that is in me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit, with, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, there's the real reason I'm reading this scripture. I have no idea what that's like. But I want my youth. It's right there. I want my youth renewed as the eagles. I thought, one of the, I thought I'd like to buy one of those houses they're building right up there so I could zip line in on a Sunday morning. I think, that would, I think that would be impressive. And everybody, of course, then I'd have to walk back up the hill. I had one of those weird experiences. Um, that was a couple of years ago. Linda and I were walking along, and I'm, she's on the outside. I'm, I'm here, and we're walk, walking along next to a plate glass window, big plate glass window. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this old man who is right up on my heels. He's like walking right here. And I'm going... Do I risk, risk turning him around and like turn around and like give him a heart attack? Or what, what do I do? It's like he's walking way too close, uncomfortably close, un-American, <laughs> you know, close. And so I finally said, man, this is making me nervous. So I started to turn, and as I turned, the reflection turned out to be me. <laughs> I was the old man. And I said, get off my back, old man. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? Haunting me this way. I want, my, I want my youth renewed like the eagles. I don't know what that means, but there it is in God's word. Let's take one out of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 9. I read this a couple of days ago. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Read your Bibles. Darn you. <laughs> Read your Bibles. There's a source of hope. That is, it sits there, 
It sits there day after day, and you in the throes of hopelessness, and the book with the promises is within your reach. How about praying? Do you talk to him? I don't mean just give him a list. Say, here's the things I want you to do before I get home, you know? But, but that moment where you talk with him and you listen, where, where you take moments of encouragement and then you think about what you've read in, your, in the word and you think about what's happened in the times of prayer. Are you praying? Are you meditating on the goodness of God? Are you developing and maintaining relationships with solid, experienced believers? People who've been out ahead of you and have, have fought the battles and they, they know the faithfulness of God. Or do you go to those people who seem to want to pull your faith apart? Who, who f- would feel better if you were down wallowing with them and then you wonder why you don't have any, any hope in your life. Find the people who live with hope, who are overflowing with hope. Those people will encourage you. Have, have you got people in your life that you feel better when you've been with them rather than worse? Hang with those people. It's like you should know this by now. Hang with those people who make you better and not with those people who tear you apart. You hear me? I don't know what there is. Something's wrong with us. But those people, go with the experienced ones. Do you weather vein in his direction when things don't go right? Do I turn in his direction? Do you speak life when you feel like death? The Bible says that the power of life and death is where? (laughs) Right here in my mouth. Do you speak death? Do you go to that apocalyptic end every single time? It's cancer. No, it's a mosquito bite. (laughs) Are you that person? It's no wonder you wrestle with hopelessness. Train yourself. You can be someone else. I'm not talking about wishful thinking. My wife calls me Pollyanna from time to time. (laughs) I... You know, like, I, I see the glass is half full. You know, I'm one, of those, I'm one of those people. It's very helpful. I'm one of those people. But those times when you get down and you start to see this other thing and you begin to proclaim, you start to make proclamation over you and over other people, and it's negative and hurtful and damaging, and there's no way to recover. We put it into our kids. We put it into our neighbors. We put it into our coworkers, this thing. Rather than being that one who, who has the source of life, begins to speak the source of life into other people. Your mouth has a lot to do with hope. Speak hope. Speak hope and believe it. Let's pray. We're done. Father, thank you for the ability to hope. I want to hope, Lord. It's a matter of perspective. I want to see better from where you see. And it's so hard when I get down, Lord, and I get, get in the trench, and I, and I can't, I can't, it's, I can't see the light, Lord. When, when, when life's in the dumper, it's hard to believe God's good. But, Lord, you, you don't change. My circumstances do not change you. Therefore, it's to you I must run. Father, you're the changer of life. You're the changer of circumstance. You're the changer of futures. You're the one who heals. May we turn our lives to you, Lord, the one and only who will be here when the rest of this disintegrates. You are the only one who will be here, and in you, Lord, we place our hope. Thank you for this this church and these people. Lord, make it a, a week full of hope. Pour grace on them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.